We all like to receive gifts unless we're playing chess and that gift happens to be Greek. Hi everyone, I was grinding leaf trophies a few weeks ago and I played a lot more games than I usually do and ended up having some really really nice games that I've made a note of to show you both for entertainment and educational purposes. Today I'll be showing you one such game where I was able to give my opponent a nice little Greek gift and an even more satisfying mate that I hope you'll enjoy as much as I did. The game started with the French and I play a line that looks a little strange, it is pretty strange and I need to actually go study it a little bit more to understand what I have to do if my opponent doesn't fall for the Greek gift sacrifice or doesn't go wandering around with their queen. But the way it goes is after knight to f3, d5, you go knight to c3, they develop their knight in one of the lines, we push the pawn, knight goes back, d4, very very normal move in the French, it is c5, we take, which is also an odd looking move, and then after bishop to c5 I've realized through experience that move order is a very important thing. See in this line what you want to do is you generally want to go bishop to f4 and bishop to d3 and that's your kind of setup, but if you go bishop to f4 first then queen b6 hits your pawn on f2 and it's hitting the pawn on b2 and things start to get a little bit dodgy in this situation. So over here, if we go back a move or two, bishop to d3 is a lot better because now if they play queen to b6, we can just castle and things are okay. Let's say they develop their knight to c6, we can then win the bishop for the knight by going knight to a4 and forking these two pieces. And it's even possible sometimes to just develop your c1 bishop, let's say bishop to f4 as planned, because if they take the pawn on b2, you often end up capturing the queen, which is the queen wandering that I was talking about earlier that I'm quite comfortable playing against. If we go back to the actual game though, after I played bishop to d3, my opponent played knight to c6 instead of queen to b6, so I went bishop to f4, because now my pawn is being attacked twice by my opponent, but I'm defending it twice as well. The other thing about bishop to f4 is it looks like it's quite a reactionary move. You attack my pawn, I'm going to defend it. And for black, it's not that clear what you should continue with. Take a look at this position, and based just on gut instinct, what would you play for black over here? A lot of us would just automatically castle because you can't develop your pieces, so these ones are already developed and the bishop can't actually go anywhere, and the things you want to do in the start of the game is develop your pieces and get your king to safety. So castling and getting your king to safety seems like a very very logical option. Unfortunately here king safety is the exact opposite of what you achieve after castling because I'm now able to go and offer you a beautiful Greek gift with bishop takes h7. A Greek gift is usually when the bishop takes on h7 or h2, it's called a sacrifice because you're often, well you're offering up the bishop so it's a bishop sacrifice, and there are three conditions that you need in order to have your Greek gift work. Let me show you the three conditions and you'll see as we go through the actual game why these three things are so important. The first thing is that the king needs to be the only piece that is busy defending this h7 pawn. Let's say there was a knight on f6, then the knight can just capture back and we're not going to potentially draw the king out into the open. The second thing that needs to be in place is you need to be able to hop with a knight to g5. The knight needs to be safely going there, in this case for example queen can capture the knight but then after bishop takes back the queen, we want a queen for a knight and we're quite happy about this, whereas if there was a bishop on e7 then knight to g5 is not a possibility because the bishop can capture even if we weren't losing a piece, even if it was just a trade, then our bishop sacrifice does not work. The third condition that then needs to be met is our queen needs to have a clear path to the square h5 after our knight moves out of the way. So if we had a knight blocking us on e2 then unfortunately our attack is probably going to be too slow. So the three conditions are the king has to be the only thing defending h7, our knight needs to be able to safely hop to g5, and thirdly our queen needs to be able to go to h5 after the knight has moved out of the way. In this position you can see that all three of those things are met, so let's see what happens in the different variations. By the way, if you are enjoying this video so far, it really does help me out a lot if you leave a like on the video, so please do that and it helps me out so that more people will see the video. With any sacrifice, you always have to see what happens if they just accept the sacrifice. So if king goes to h7, we can go knight to g5, and if the king goes back, after queen to h5, we're in a little bit of a situation as black. Checkmate on h7 is being threatened, and because the knight's also covering f7, an option like f6 or f5 to create an escape square for the king is not a possibility, the knight is protecting it. If we move our rook across to e8, unfortunately we still get checkmated after queen takes f7, king goes across, queen back to h5 check, king goes across, and now that we've removed the f7 pawn we can go queen to h7 check, king goes across, queen to h8 check, king has to go over here, and now this is just checkmate as the queen is protecting these squares, the pawn is protecting this square, and there's no way that you can put a piece in between to block the check. 
So if we rewind a couple of moves to our original position before all of this happened, after queen to h5, since you can't stop the mate, black's only option to kind of stop mate is to go queen takes g5, but then you're giving up the queen for a knight and you should still be losing pretty drastically. So if we go back to this situation over here after knight to g5 check, the king going back here either gives up the queen or gets checkmated, so king to g6 is the other option that you can look at. Unfortunately this is still losing though for black, so queen to d3 check and then swinging across to the g-file, or going directly to the g-file, you're setting up a lot of tactics, a lot of tricks, and while it is still a little bit difficult for white to convert the position, white should still be winning overall. What you can do is if you're not entirely sure how this would be winning, or you want to check that you'd be able to do this in a real game, try and play out a position like this against a training partner or against the computer, because remember you did invest a bishop in the attack for a pawn, and you need to make sure that your attack still continues and that you end up getting your bishop back plus some interest. Going back to the actual game, after bishop takes h7, my opponent decided it was just far too dangerous to take the bishop, so they went king to h8. The best move for me here is to just calmly go back bishop d3, patience is often a very important thing. I've won a pawn, I've also made the black king quite unsafe, there's a massive open h-file to the king potentially in future, and I can just do things like queen to e2, queen side castle, take my time, use my extra material and the open file, and I should be able to get a nice win. But I am an 1800 and I am impatient, so I just decided to act as though they had taken my bishop on h7 and I continued with knight to g5, which isn't losing, but it does decrease the advantage a little bit. My opponent now captured on e5, which is a really good move, but unfortunately they took with the wrong knight. The problem with this is that while it does remove a defender of the f6 square, we now can't hop to f6 and defend ourselves. If we had instead captured with the other knight, then, if I continue my attack with queen to h5, and it doesn't take a fortune teller to tell us that I'm probably planning queen h5 on my next move, now we have the move knight to f6, which we don't have if we had captured the pawn with the f6 knight. This is now attacking the queen and it's defending the h7 square. So let's say I try and go for a discovered attack, that would be rather unpleasant because I just lose my queen entirely, and now we're losing. And if I try to keep my queen on the h file, then you can play a move like knight to g4. The idea with knight to g4 is that first you're threatening bishop takes f2 where you're attacking the queen and the king at the same time, and then also you're busy potentially defending this square in future if you need to hop back to g6, but also with the knight on f6 everything seems to be quite defended and it's difficult to see how white can continue the attack over here. The nuanced difference between taking with this knight versus taking with this knight is quite difficult to spot, especially in a blitz game, so you can't blame my opponent for capturing the pawn with a piece that looked as though it was giving a little bit more space for their pieces to move around in. With a pretty one-track mind, I continued with queen to h5. Fortunately here, this is the best move in the situation because it's setting up a deadly discovered check and then checkmate. My opponent decided to go for pawn to g6, which is attacking the queen and making sure that I don't have a discovered check over here, and swooping in with the queen because then, once again, I just blunder my queen. More importantly though, g6 also gives the king an escape route, so it can go here, here, and run away, and potentially you can survive the attack. Bishop takes on g6 is therefore though a move that plays itself because you're removing the attack of the queen, it's a discovered check, and you're winning a pawn all in a single move. The king went to g7, that is the only move that doesn't get checkmated, king over here, and that is checkmate. So after king to g7, the move that I found I was quite proud of, and it actually got marked as a brilliancy by chess.com. Although I know brilliancies do depend on your level, so maybe I've just been playing bad chess and that's why it was marked as a brilliancy. If you'd like to try spot the move and how you'd continue the attack over here as white, you can pause the video quickly before I continue. See, a move like queen to h7 looks really natural, but after king to f6, you have to take a little bit of time to decide how you're going to continue the attack, or if you're just going to sit and chill and castle and get your king to safety and then continue the attack a little bit later. It's a blitz game as well, so you don't want to spend too much time trying to figure out and then end up either being down material or just running out of time and flagging the game. So if we go back to the original position, if you found the move knight takes e6, congratulations, you have found the move the mates in four. It took me a couple of extra moves to finish the game, but even if you don't find the mate, the move makes a lot of sense. Firstly, it's forking the king and the queen so you can't just ignore it, and actually here if you go king to f6, you can get checkmate in 3 moves, it ends up in a position that's very similar to what happened in the actual game, so let me know in the comments if you're able to figure out the mate in 3 from here. Of course if you go back with the king you're just going to get checkmated on h7 again, so your other options are then to capture with the pawn or the bishop. 
And if you do one of these two things, so bishop takes for example, you end up getting checkmate with queen h6, king to f6, and bishop to g5 checkmate. If I'm being completely honest, I don't think I saw this variation, but my spidey senses were tingling and telling me that knight takes e6 was just completely winning, and at worst, I was going to be able to get a bishop g5 move in at some stage that would then skewer or fork, I always get confused about the terminology, but skewer the king to the queen and I'd end up winning some material. What happened in the game though was my opponent took on e6 with their pawn and here missing the checkmate so once again queen h6 king over here and bishop g5 is not only winning the queen it is checkmate. I ended up going for a different check so I went bishop to h6 because I think I was thinking along the lines of king over here bishop to g5 I'm winning the queen and if the king steps back worst case scenario I'm winning some material. The king did step back and now I saw a tactic that after bishop takes f8 you can't capture back with the queen because then you get mated. You can't capture with the bishop because then you get mated. And I missed this but so does my opponent. Black does have a bit of a defense with bishop takes f2 with the idea that if you take over here the queen can maybe capture back with check so you, there isn't time to checkmate. But we did both miss this and what ended up happening was my opponent took on f8. When you're attacking it's a good idea to keep in mind that you need to go for forcing moves and try and make sure that the king has as few squares to go to as possible because you don't want the king to just escape from your mating net. Over here then I went queen to h8 check with the idea that all of these squares are busy being attacked so the king can only go to e7. The next move which makes sense is moving a little bit closer so going to g7 over here you're cutting off these escape squares this one's also cut off this one's also cut off so black is now left with two options king to d6 and knight to f7. My opponent chose to go to d6 and then I managed to get the very very satisfying mate knight to b5 checkmate because the knight is the checking the king and the king just can't go back and it's blocked in by its own pieces. I always find it very very satisfying to checkmate with a knight whether it's smothered mate or a mate like this but I suppose an even bigger flex would have been if my opponent had gone knight to f7 a couple of moves previously instead of king to d6 because this one you get to go queen takes f7 check, king has to go over here it's forced, you still get to do the nice little knight check on b5, the king can now escape though to e5 because the knight is no longer there and then see if you can spot the next move which is checkmate. It's a crazy checkmate that is not that difficult when you look at it but I feel like in a game it could be tricky to spot this just because there are so many open spaces around the king. The mate of course is pawn to f4 checkmate. The knight is covering these two squares, the bishop has the square covered, the queen has these two squares covered and is busy protecting the pawn as well and I think the ultimate flex in chess is to be able to checkmate with a pawn. This was a really fun game for me to play even if it wasn't 100% accurate and it shows you some of the crazy positions that you can get or avoid if you keep an eye out for Greek gifts in future. Thank you very much for watching, happy chessing, and if you want to see some more of my abundant generosity you can check out how I gifted my opponent a free queen in a daily chess game by clicking on this video over here.